Welcome viewers to 28th episode of Beyond Phrenology. We are extremely delighted to have with us uh, uh, Dr. Raul Bongers from the Netherlands. Uh, Dr. Bongers uh, is an associate professor at the University of Groningen Medical School. Uh, extremely prolific scientist in the field of human sciences, human movement sciences. Uh, I know I've been following uh, Dr. Bongers since uh, since my early undergrad years. You know, I used to cite him, his early work on tool use. Uh, and later, I was fortunate to also meet him when he came to University of Georgia and gave a talk uh, in the lab of uh, Professor Carl Newell. Uh, and since then, I think we have met once more at one conference, I feel. And uh, But I, we have been following each other's work, uh, you know, uh, pretty closely. So welcome, uh, Raul, to the show. Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madhu. Uh, I'm, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. I'm honored to, to be here. And I think this is a great initiative, uh, this uh, podcast. I'm uh, happy to uh, to contribute and to uh, to join you in the discussion. Yeah. Thanks, all. Uh, Raul, you have a very uh, interesting career and you are, you are situated in a, a you know hospital setting. A lot of work, your work is in the basic sciences. You know, some of it crosses the boundaries of basic and goes into the clinical domain. So could you describe a little bit more about, you know, how you ended up where you are right now and uh, what kind of motivated you to the current control questions in motor control and what kind of research is happening in your lab right now? Yeah. Uh, the, well, so I did my uh, undergraduate program in Amsterdam at the human movement, uh, movement science. And after, and, and I, uh, during that, I did an uh, internship um, uh, because I always was interested, um, I, I was trained there as an ecological psychologist or from dynamic systems approach uh, by uh, Claire Michaels and uh, Peter Beek. Uh, but I always was sort of intrigued also by this brain. So mm -hmm. I, um, I I was not just satisfied by how things would work at the level of uh, of behavior. I wanted to know somewhat more, if I had more, uh, also different things. So we went to the lab of uh, Dan Bullock uh, in the lab of uh, Steve Grossberg in, in Boston, where I did an internship. And basically we collected some data on, on reaching movements in, uh, in Amsterdam. And we uh, modeled these, uh, these, uh, these advanced movements uh, uh, with the Vita model and made an adaptation uh, of that. Uh, and that's really, uh, was of course in the in the profile of getting uh, getting into science and the funny thing is that at that point i decided if everybody thought i want to go into science then i usually start to think something else so i i uh i thought about um uh, starting my own company to uh, apply ecological uh, psychological approaches and and principles to to uh ergono ergonomy or or but I couldn't really get that off the ground, and um, perhaps I was not motivated enough. I don't know. And at one point, I um, I spoke to somebody and I said, "Well, I need some time to build a model where you can insert uh, properties of the uh, of the um, uh, apparatus or tool or whatever, and uh, then I uh, then I have my model based on these ecological principles, and I can tell you how to change this." And this person asked me, do you do you have that model? Mm -hmm. I said, no, no, no. But if you pay me, I, I can work on that to develop uh, that. And this person said, well, then if you first develop this model, and then I, I uh, then we talk. Yeah. Um, and then I came across this um, a PhD position with Claire uh, that was going to happen in Nijmegen. Uh, what was about tool use, where actually the idea was um, how uh, properties of tools uh, affect the affordances uh, that you have with that tool or that you perceive with that tool. And um, I thought, well, actually, that is that is a very, in a basic, very basic sense, uh, building this model. Yeah. And uh, so I thought oh, that's, a, that's a really nice uh, topic for me. So I went there. And I remember, I still remember the first day when I got uh, into my office in the in the lab and in my office, and I started reading uh, papers and, and thinking about this uh, in a sort of official PhD capacity, a uh, PhD student capacity. I I uh, I thought, well, this was the stupidest idea that I ever wanted to go outside science. This is what I want to do. <laughs> and since then, I never ever thought about uh, about leaving. I did my PhD there um, in developmental psychology, and uh, we, the idea was 
uh, if you have changes of um, um, the body uh, due to growth, um, and you that that's when your affordances change. Are these the same, or the, can you sort of model that or mimic that with um, with changes of tools? Because right. with tools you also change affordances. That was sort of the underlying idea, and we got some. Uh, some findings of, of adults, what they could perceive and, and uh, that uh, that it really was affordance in terms of those properties of the environment and properties of the body that uh, that affected these uh, perceived reaching abilities. And you saw also some developmental trends uh, in there. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then I wanted to continue in, uh, in science and I was a postdoc position in Amsterdam on, uh, <clears throat> on the... Uh, uh, perceptual system to pick up uh, informa information for fly balls. Yeah, and that's what I uh, did then, and it, it allowed me to to think about perceptual systems and also their flexibility, and their um, uh, it gave me some ideas how to how to think about the brain. Yeah, um, we, we we can talk later about uh, these things, yeah, but that um, uh, that. Yeah, it was really, really a, a, a shaping time uh, for me. And then in the Netherlands, there were not that many jobs. So I uh, moved to France. <clears throat> I worked there with uh, Reinhard Bootsma in a in a position yeah. that was partly teaching and partly uh, 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 research. And there I uh, did some uh, dynamic modeling of uh, 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 the rhythmic fits uh, task. And we showed that depending on the task constraints, that you could actually cover a wide range of, of different aspects of this task with this dynamic model uh, just by tweaking uh, the parameters. So you could conceive of these task constraints as setting the parameters for which you then had your uh, that the system built as a tractor that you could then perform this uh, this movement. Okay. Um, then it was time to get a permanent position, and we, we I was lucky that there were some positions here in Groningen with uh, human movement science. Frank Sales uh, had moved here just a year before, and I was uh, hired to teach uh, motor development. And then we were actually uh, since then I was always left uh, very free to do my uh, to do to do my research. Yeah. Uh, after about five years, I I switched to teaching to motor control. And um, I uh, um, during that period also to 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 get this is a bit the dual things. It was a way to attract be attract money, um, but also to to ground my position in the university medical center. I thought, well, if I know something about tools and tool use, what is sort of a topic that is relatively close. And I ended up in thinking about prosthetics. And now for more than 20 years, I collab I work here for 20 years, something years. And since then I collaborate uh, with Corey van der Sluis, a rehabilitation uh, doctor. Um, and, and she has the patient perspective and I have the sort of motor learning, motor control uh, yeah. perspective. And that is, uh, yeah, uh, developed into a, 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 a program uh, where we actually have a quite unique uh, position because not many people from a real movement science perspective uh, study uh, prosthesis. Prosthesis, yeah. I mean, that's that's true across the world. I mean, not just probably Netherlands. Like, there are very few people who study prosthesis from the tool use perspective, as well as within that from an ecological perspective of embodiment and how to yeah. integrate it that so that it moves exactly like the hand. Yeah. And and for viewers who uh, who might not know the background here, uh, and a lot of times, you know, people ask me this question, like, what's a, uh, what's important for studying motor control? What's the end goal? So you have a, one of the immediate applications here that once you have a prosthesis, uh, there's a very low rate of acceptance of prosthesis. And one of the reasons is that it doesn't feel, it doesn't move like the real uh, limb, uh, and more so true for the upper limbs. And the idea that we can study motor control and make them uh, have people have more agency or embodiment of those uh, uh, yeah. prosthesis yeah. within the body kind of it's very attractive from a clinical standpoint. Yeah, yeah, that's that's uh, that's definitely what you see. And um, it, I have to admit that it took me quite some uh, some years to find a kind of sweet spot in that uh, domain. 
So we, we started off, uh, I, I uh, remember this with my first uh, student, we, we started working on this and the idea was, um, well, I said, well, collect the papers where they studied uh, movement, the grasping movements of the prosthesis, because I thought that's what you do with the prosthesis. Yeah. It turned out there was one paper by uh, Wing and Fraser or Fraser and Wing on, on 86. Yeah. And they had one participant grasp an object with a prosthesis and the rest there was nothing and uh, so the first thing that we set out to do is uh, bring a prosthesis user in the lab and just collect their um, their uh, their kinematics of this reaching and grasping movement and we found that even if, if you think of regular movement <clears throat> regular reaching and grasping there's a kind of a, um, a timing of the grasp movement to the reach yeah. movement but in this yeah. prosthesis, it's, it's really decoupled. So you have this plateau phase. So basically, you have, you have this object. You move to a regular, you move to it, you open, you close around the object. Right. But the prosthesis you do, they, they sort of open it, open the hand, move it here, and then close it. So it's a different different strategy, which probably has to do with, um, with uh, the, uh, the feedback uh, that is lacking. But the interesting... Um, uh, the thing is, if we then uh, used users of uh, different levels, it turned out that there is a kind of uh, relationship between this plateau phase and the, and the so the time that they keep their hand open uh, and their uh, function uh, scores on a functional test. So, uh, hand opening control, um, obviously, which um, yeah somehow was an entry into to more functional, more fluid use of this prosthesis. And yeah. so we set out to develop a serious game to um, to improve that uh, control uh, of the hand opening. And that um, that is that is uh, a bit what we now that's our one of our latest uh, things that we um, just recently we we. Uh, worked uh, together with the company of uh, uh, to build a virtual reality uh, uh, setup um, and there also we tried to uh, to do some similar measurements unfortunately that didn't work out uh, yet but that's one one of these um, lines of research in using these uh, insights of um, of um, uh, how how, how anatomical or natural axes are coordinated and to see how what is the deviation with the prosthesis okay. to see where you can improve uh, uh, this and then find tools to 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 tweak or to 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 change uh, that <laughs> so so Raul, coming back to you know the basic framework which you explore these things from the ecological standpoint so you know uh, let's say we contrast it with the representational standpoint and we'll go to the development later, but in this context of prosthesis, uh, how does the ecological ha approach helps more or is able to explain things or understand the, the whole uh, learning or relearning process uh, in a much better manner than, for instance, uh, you know, an intermodal based representational uh, framework yeah. allows? I, I have to be honest about this. It has yeah. not, uh, it has not, um, uh, moved mountains in the field as I as I hoped or wanted. Yeah. Uh, part of that has to do with the sort of leading culture in that field, because you can imagine that in that field, there are a lot of uh, engineers working. Yeah. Because they are built these uh, prosthesis. Yeah. And um, that the, the lead, their dominant view is a kind of an internal model uh, approach. Yeah. So that... Um, uh, makes that you have to come from far to 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 sort of convince uh, them. I think one of the um, clearest uh, study where we where we did that was the uh, the work of uh, Lutke van Dijk, where we actually showed that if you um, the, the general idea in this field is you you just have to so th so the basic the basic type of prosthesis just for 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 the audience that people know this. So um, what you do is you you measure uh, usually uh, two uh, two muscles, uh, roughly the uh, wrist extensors and wrist uh, flexor, flexors, and these uh, are detected by um, uh, dry uh, EMG electrodes that are uh, mounted in a in a socket, 
and they are connected to a motor. And then a uh, wrist flexion uh, closes the hand and wrist uh, extension opens the hand. That's what these, these uh, prosthesis users are, uh, try to do in, in, in a very simple case. Um, and um, the general idea is that as long as you control that myo signal, control this EMG signal from those muscles, then you can uh, operate this prosthesis. So what they, what they do often, they have relatively uh, simple uh, games on the computer and they connect these electrodes to the muscles and then um, they train that and people train uh, driving a car through uh, through a maze or whatever you can imagine through uh, an obstacle path and then um, if people can do that then they get a prosthesis and what we showed with the serious uh, game uh, work of Ludwig is that that's that assumption does not hold. Um, the idea that a lot of people in this field have is that there is something like a general myocontrol skill. And then depending on the task, you just use that skill for either controlling a car on a screen, controlling your prestigious, controlling any game that you want. Um, and But that is... Uh, quite against the kind of an ecological approach where you say, well, you have a specific task that where you have task constraints that are part perceptual. Yeah. And based on, on these interactions of all these constraints, you have a specific niche, a specific attractor of this system of how it can work. Um, and that is actually what we showed in, the, in, in several studies that you, if you train, uh, your training to some to quite a large extent, needs to mimic the this task and the situation and for which you train. Uh, so you're tra right. Your tra the training is task yeah. specific. Yeah. And and that is actually um uh, in rehabilitation this notion of task uh, specificity yeah. is used a lot to describe um um to say the task needs to be exactly the same. But that's not the point from an ecological perspective. From an ecological perspective, at least to me, task specificity means that you use the same information movement coupling. And if you right. use that, the same, so the information, so you pick up the, the same information that is coupled to your movement in the same way, you use the same control law. And if you can use the same control law in two tasks, then there will be transfer between those tasks. Right. If that's not, then this falls apart. So we tried this, for instance, people, we, we tried, uh, I think, five different, uh, Anik Heerskop, one of our students uh, did that. We, we have five different um, uh, myocontrol tasks, and we ranked the uh, users on, on their performance. And it turned out that if you were good at one task, you were not necessarily good at the other task. Because in each of these tasks, you had your own information movement coupling. Mm. And that is, so that is uh, something um, uh, what uh, ecological psychology uh, really, uh, for me, really contributed. Um, but the point is, is heavily debated in the, in the, uh, in the community, um, partly um, uh, because uh, in rehabilitation science, this notion of task uh, specificity is used in a different way. So that it's it's we should have used in other words to describe it, but but that was the word that that fitted in yeah. our community. So that that um, yeah, <clears throat> this happens so, so often that you know people start using a word and then uh, the word loses its meaning because of yeah so many varied interpretations of those words. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Right. So, um, yeah, I, so, so that's a, a, an important line of research. Uh, and we uh, now are more in the motor control uh, domain uh, of that. But we can talk about that later. It's, it's, uh, right. Yeah. So, uh, so I mean, uh, so, so does it also translate or do you, do you see this translating? So in the sense like, okay, now we understand that just being able to play a particular game or a particular task uh, is not like a foolproof evidence that the person will be able to use that prosthesis under similar situations, given that the informational coupling 
with the controller would be different across those situations. So uh, that kind of opens like a can of worms, like how do we address that? So yes, we are able to identify this using the ecological approach to you know prosthetic control. But when somebody is designing, an engineer can argue, for instance, like, okay, it might not work in most situations, but in some situations under very constraints, it works. Uh, you have pointed out a problem, but what exactly is the solution you know, to be able to incorporate that kind of variability, uh, which we see in everyday life in that controller space. So any thoughts on that? Yeah, that's, 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 um, this, this makes me remind, remind, this reminds me of this, this remark that uh, Michael Turvey always use, uh, science is hard. <laughs> yes. And the point is, uh, Lutger has a nice paper of, of different views on motor control and in their relation to rehabilitation, where we distinguish yeah. this uh, a vertical uh, approach and a horizontal uh, approach. So you have a kind of hierarchical approach and, and uh, ecological approach would be more uh, a horizontal uh, view. Um, the point is, if you, if you, if you, if you argue that functionality, because that's what we're talking about in terms of task specificity, is functionality is the important thing, then it's difficult to come up with a training regime that is different than training just that task. So if yeah. you have a kind of a structural approach where you say, well, you have different elements, uh, muscle force or muscle coordination, yeah. You can just come up with everything to train that. And then you have to do some, um, yeah, I call this magic, but that there are models then you and you use that and right. then use and, different and, and you keep calling new models and new models yeah, uh, but for then, new things, right? Yeah, and then but the, the thing is the, the from a structural approach, yeah. it's very easy to disentangle to determine what you uh, need to train. From a functional approach. Uh, you don't have that much room because it's the function thing that you need to, to train. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, some tasks, uh, we do them a lot, but basically they're quite boring. Yeah. And that's with this prestigious. Um, so yeah. that, um, the, 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 that's one part of it. The other part is, if you think about ecological psychology, um, we have, of course, uh, a lot of, uh, of, of of several visual informational uh, variables, although not that much, not that many, sorry. Um, we have something about dynamic touch, but if you use your hands and you have grip force, then it becomes, well, I'm not sure if we have a good idea what kind of informational variables uh, in terms of a invariant in, in some kind of flow field, it, it plays a role there. So yeah. this, and, and, and for prestigious users, this is very important, uh, grasp an object. So I think also one of our problems is that our community is relatively small. So you don't have the manpower to generate these, all these informational variables that you could use. And and that that is one of the issues I think for for um, uh, in the prestigious is to um, to come up with um, uh, also the perceptual part because the yeah. prestigious now most of them are um, bad. there are some some very basic things that the prestigious regulates itself like uh, like slippage control these kind of things but actually um, if you have to feed back uh, information about the grip force uh, to a vibrotactile uh, vibrotactile device. Um, this 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 there, there are some people as uh, Doos in, in Denmark does some very interesting work uh, on that. Who, um, uh, but that is a very restricted setting, which is still very far removed from uh, how to use this uh, in daily in daily life with different types of objects where you have all kinds of noise around you that you need to pay attention. You have double tasks, these kind of things. Yeah. Um, 
So um, th that's another bridge that we need to get from ecological uh, psychology, that, all, that, that we need to generate more informational variables, I think, yeah. for, for different modalities too. To, uh, to be able to to expand our range of behaviors that we can explain. Is it because uh, we do not have those? So for instance, when we are talking about informational variables guiding movements, and Tao, for instance, has been the classic you know poster child for such variables uh, <laughs> from the catching the fly work. And there have been others, you know, in haptic perception, for instance, the work of, uh, you know, uh, uh, polymer M M M amazine and, and, and groups like yeah. that. Uh, do we uh, do we have less number of variables or do we you know we have less progress comparatively in identifying those variables because of the human capacity or just because it is hard i mean we generate so much of data now than we could ever generate right so michael turvey and group for instance generated much less data but a lot of insights and a lot of groundbreaking work yeah. in those yeah, yeah. in that decade compared to i can generate that much of data like within probably three months that probably Michael Turvey, you know, he generated during those 10 years because the technology was very different, right? Yeah. But at the same no, time, think, right? Thinking is, yeah, but thinking is, is much the tougher point, than... The point is with ecological psychology and also yeah. in dynamic systems, yeah. you, you take some principles. Right. And those principles guide you uh, through searching for explanations. Yes. Um, which is different from, well, what sometimes happens is that explaining the problem away because yeah. there is a model that takes part of stuff, of things. Right. And that 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 is and and that makes it hard right. because um, those principles are very uh, generic. Yeah, that otherwise it wouldn't be a principle. Yes. Um, and how to translate that to a specific uh, situation stop. under the con under the condition that you also can measure something in a meaningful way. Yeah. That um, well, that's that's hard. And and actually, and I myself am to blame for that. Yeah. We don't do that enough. And but this has also to do with the fact that. Um, you need to push the system to a certain limit to be able to play that trick. Because um, I think in a regular reaching movement, yeah. there is there are so many informational variables that sort of do the trick good enough mm. that, well, probably the system sometimes uses this and other times uses that. And it is, it's difficult to come up with a situation. So we have to go to, for instance, to um, interceptive actions. Yeah. But, but if I, if th that is one of the issues that we have, that I have at the moment, and well, for a while, um, I would like, love to, to study these, uh, these uh, hand opening and closing uh, from, and, and the information use of that from an ecological perspective. But I don't really find the, the, proper, the proper inroad uh, to, uh, to that. Yeah. Um, and um, um, uh, where was I heading uh, with this? Um, the, 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 um, okay, yeah. So we have defined in the field uh, the uh, several variables that act in interceptive actions. But the rehabilitation field does not take me serious if I say, oh, let's start to study interceptive actions with prestigious yeah. because people hardly use their prestigious in daily life, let alone to catch a ball. Right. So they, they, and, and this, and I, I mean, it's very difficult that you won't find users who a lot of users who can catch a ball with the prosthesis. So yes. then you push the system too much, and, and I haven't I haven't figured that out how to how to do that. I would love to do that, and right. and, and we we are generate we, we have sometimes a discussion, and then I think ah perhaps there, but it has not. No, you, so so you're right. I mean, I, I face this you know in my own uh, you know work. So for instance, I am extremely interested in. Supraposture activities like standing and doing stuff. Yeah. Uh, and when I look at the literature, most of what we know about standing is basically, first of all, it's quiet stance. You ask people to maintain a stable stance. 
uh, without much perturbation. So even like slip perturbations are like very kind of lame compared to what we do in real life. And extended standing has been like two minute trials. So if somebody stands for two minutes, it's, it's called extended standing. When I'm standing on the bus stand, like every now and then for like 15 minutes to, you know, wait for the bus. Yeah. So for instance, I'm, I'm starting new experiments where people are asked to stand for like 30 minutes uh, yeah. at the very least. And we want to see like what happens, you know, over time in terms of your postural control. Uh, and likewise, you know, we have so many assumptions uh, in research and we get into this, you know, dead zone of just iterating the same things because it's there in the literature. We kind of cite and we go, we go into these cycles of thinking that that's what reality is. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and not pushing the system towards what it can do actually and it can do yeah. so much more. Yeah. 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 No, that's um um yeah, that's one of these uh, one of these issues. And 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 uh so we have a lot of discussions within ecological psychology on, on what information is and how you should think about uh think about that. But that that's uh I've I think for the most part, very far removed from then actually think about how these this this knowledge can be used to actually help uh, people and build a clinical, uh, uh, come up with some clinical uh, applications. Right. Yeah. So now where does tool use come into play in terms of prosthesis? Like, so you started with, and you transitioned from you yeah. know, studying tool use. Uh, and some of your most cited articles are also on tool use, you know, incorporation yeah. as synergies in the body. And yeah. then a prosthesis. So could you explain a little bit of on that bridge? Yes. Um I have to say that it it, it, it the, the tool the work of two use was an inspiration to to go to the prosthesis. Yeah. But I have never um this has to do also with some uh, personal interest. Uh it, it, it never matured into a, a, an actual research uh, program. Um because I th I I think where the two where they meet, at least for me, is um, has to do with embodiment. Um, but embodiment is a a, a very broad uh, term, and oh, depending yeah. on, on the field that you talk to, they they, they mean completely different uh, things. Exactly. Um, which in, then also for me is a kind of a minefield uh, to go with. You have to really sort of sit down and 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 define yourself very. So in a in a conversation like this, you can talk about the body man, and we both sort of have right. a general notion what we think about that. Um. So I think the ideas on on tool use and uh, body schema and uh, uh, embodiment yeah. are. Um, uh, relevant for uh, prosthesis use, and um, somebody like uh, Tamama Kin is doing very interesting uh, brain scanning work on on uh, that the, the the representation of a tool uh, becomes a separate category, a new category in the in the in the cortex uh, in terms of representation. Of course, the representation of the of the prosthesis becomes a, a separate category. So. Um, we have been thinking about how to um, to start to work on embodiment. We have done some 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 pilot projects in the past, uh, let's say uh, seven years. Sometimes with students, we sort of piloted something and never got to something serious. Uh, part of that is because I think for most prosthesis users, the perceptual feedback coupling um, of the prosthesis and the difficulty of controlling the actual prosthesis, the, because there's a large delay, because you give a signal and it lasts two to 300 milliseconds before, before you get an effect. Then you have the straight, you have only visual feedback, which also lasts long. So this is sort of, I mean, it's a nightmare in terms of if you if you think about the control system that has to deal with this. Right. Uh, we sort of define that only for very few users, this prosthesis is actually embodied. There are a few of them who can uh, 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 tie a knot uh, at the, on their back, but most people can, most prosthesis users cannot. They have to visually see it to move things. Right? They have to Always. visually control. Yeah, it goes very slowly. Uh, not comp no no sequence of 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 grips or sequence of actions. Right. Um, 
and no fine, uh, not much uh, fine motor control. Um, and there are some exceptional cases, and these are the cases that you see on YouTube. Uh, yeah. Uh, but for the most uh, users, it's uh, it's it's yeah. it's not embodied at all. So it's for the viewers, like those one or two cases or TikToks which we see, you know, somebody <laughs> like uh, doing wonders with their prosthesis are an exception to the rule rather than uh, yeah. a general representation of yeah of prosthetic use. Yeah. And, and I know some of these users. We have a very good user that we use as our 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 pilot uh, person for a lot of things, and uh, we can ask him often for feedback about uh, uh, what to do. So that is. Um, um but for the most users it's really a struggle yeah so for the viewers be careful with fireworks and be careful with tools uh be careful with your hands keep them that's uh that's yeah keep because, them as long as you can yeah yeah the the, the replacement is uh still very uh very immature uh, very, yeah very fundamental yeah yeah, right. No, that 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 makes sense. So now, uh, uh, so some of the very interesting things you said, and it kind of provoked some ideas, uh, you know, my head. Uh, one of the things is like apraxias. So, for instance, uh, we know different kind of apraxias where people are, are unable to use tools, or at least in some cases don't know what a tool is used for. In other cases, they can't move with the tools or or integrate them as part of the body. Uh, are there is there any work on apraxia patients who also have lost the limbs? And uh, probably studies would have found that people who have apraxias also cannot use prosthetic hands. Um, <clears throat> I'm not aware of that. Uh, I did, uh, luckily, the yeah. number of prosthesis users are uh, relatively small. Yeah. It's a good thing. Um, and then finding somebody with apraxia and a, and a prosthesis, that would be, um, yeah. Uh, yeah challenging but probably you know tms studies can be done to actually see whether uh, yeah. uh whether basically you know like your ability to use tools and prosthesis are actually very similar at the neuronal level as well in the brain um yes but the difference um i okay i have not thought about this for for a while the, the the paper that we that, that you you uh, uh, coordinated uh, a couple yes. of years ago that right, was right. one of the last things on tool use. So uh, for the viewers to know, we uh, you know I started this idea on tool use, and we had several contributors uh, to talk about tool use in a very specific manner, uh, answering the same set of questions. And Raul has one of those contributions there. Uh, it's a set of six uh, different contributors uh, giving six different perspectives on tool use, and I'll put a link in the description. Of the video, yeah. So the definition of tools, tool use, and the question is if the definition of a tool, yeah, and tool use, how that matches with a definition of prosthesis use, and the fact it has to do with a tool. I think it's separate from the definition, but a tool in itself is usually a quite passive uh, object at least about the tools I like to think about. Um, and it becomes meaningful in a certain task with a certain user. user. And um, uh, Francois Osarak uh, might, has probably a kind of a different uh, opinion because he's yeah. more on the higher techno techno uh, technology. Right, uh, right, right. He's more from the representational and you know ideational perspective rather yeah. than movement perspective. Yeah. Yeah. But a prosthesis, I see a prosthesis actually more as an assistive technology because the technology in a prosthesis makes that it does things, it, not on itself, but it, it's, it's more movable. The tools, the tools is you, in general quite rigid. Uh, yeah. Not 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 all, all, but there's a large part of tools that are quite rigid. And I'd like to think of utensils or things that lay at your desk or or your in in, in your toolbox and yeah. the, the, they the, also do not have a degrees of freedom, you know, within them for the most part. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So and, and with prosthesis, that's a bit different, and that makes that that there is there's a control aspect to prosthesis that you don't have in uh, in, tools. In, in tools in general. And uh, that makes that the, that the not maps uh, one to one uh, onto each other. 
I, okay. I think. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and it's in particular in that that uh, control aspect. There is a lot of uh, a lot of the challenge uh, for the users. Okay. Yeah. Um, and this this has uh, primarily uh, this has to do with um, the kind of expectations uh, that uh, are built in the system. To uh, so what I explained earlier was this prosthesis where you had only two uh, had two electrodes and you could open and close uh, the hand by uh, uh, wrist flexion extension. Um, Nowadays, uh, more, there are several uh, products on the market. Then they uh, use uh, more uh, electrodes, usually around six to eight, around the stump. And um, they use kind of past, uh, pattern recognition classifier to control these more um, uh, robotic hands with, with uh, several uh, movable joints and uh, things. So they, they, they look more like, like natural hands. Right. But um, the the idea behind this is just it's the idea behind it is quite beautiful because the idea is you if you perform a movement a, a certain grip type with your hand uh, finger point or then you um, perform a specific pattern of muscle activation in the in the stump yeah which we call so, synergies in everyday language right um. Well, or, or we're not there yet. We're not there. Okay, yet. okay. So it is just a, a a grip is a certain really is a certain pattern in the muscles, yeah. and with these pattern recognition devices, you can pick up that pattern and you can classify. You can train the classifier right. and right. he recognizes that pattern and performs a certain grip. Yes. Um. The the potential of that idea is 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 very huge. However, this has been. Uh, I think the people work on that for let's say about 30, 30 years, but they um, it, it never and, and, and using that in daily life you cannot get that uh, beyond let's say ninety five percent. And there is some depending on the study. Uh, sometimes you get a bit higher, sometimes you get a bit lower. But the thing is, uh, you never get it uh, fully trustable because ninety five percent means that one ev one of every uh, 20 uh, attempts is a wrong attempt. So if you are wrong, yeah. Which yeah you try to make a grip and one of, uh, it, uh, it does a yeah. misclassification, one of yeah. every uh, grip, which if that happens, if you carry your hot coffee, then you have a bit of a problem. So yeah, so, you'll be spilling a coffee, like, like for me, I'll be spilling a coffee almost every second day. Uh, yes, <laughs> depending on how how much coffee you drink. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah, so that um, so um, and we uh, and, and the solution of the field is to get into um, to uh, throw more machine learning at it. Yeah, <laughs> um, and we have had uh, two projects to uh, um, uh, Morten Christofferson and Andreas Franske did uh, it worked in a big project on that. And we, uh, with uh, several partners, uh, built a new, a new prosthesis, a new detection algorithm with uh, very advanced machine learning. I, I don't understand that. We tried it, and never, never got anything better. And it, it's now for for several years that I, I present that to this field. Um, what is the principal problem uh, there? And the principal problem from, from my perspective is that um, um, what you ask, if you want this classifier to work, you need to be very consistent in your muscle activation. Because if you want that grip, there's a small range of grips that are of, of activation patterns that are allowed within that class. And these classes need to be separate uh, far enough in, in muscle space. And um, that is uh, possible. Uh, now, there are some issues with that, but uh, let's leave them. Um, but if you start to think about that, and this is sort of the, the root to part of the other word uh, that I do, is that idea is unfeasible. Yeah. Because 
what uh, in particular in the last uh, 10 years with the uncontrolled manifold uh, method, we can get back to that later. But the idea is humans use a lot of covariation in their activation patterns for every action. Yes. And this is principally at odds with the requirements of myocontrol and prosthesis. Okay. And that, um, and that is a, uh, so, so what we did now, um, that's a bit complicated to explain now, but basically we use the same type of, same type of control that you use for prosthesis. Yeah. And you had four muscles and you activate two muscles, then the ball, a ball goes up and two muscles and the ball goes down. Well, you can make, basically, if you if you have a mapping, uh, I, have to, I have to do. Well, I'm not sure if this will work in this way. But the point is as follows: We had four muscles to control the ball in all kinds of directions, yeah. and each muscle specified a different direction. Now, what you could do, and if you thought about this as an engineer, you would expect if you have to move right up, then you activate the muscle that moves the ball right up. Yeah. However. Mm -hmm. It turns out that in all the situations, all these four muscles were active, active, compensating for each other. So the total sum of activity was what was required. But yeah. because this is positive and this is negative, then you yeah, can have compensatory uh, activation. So it turns out, uh, and, and sorry, and there was a lot of variability over repetitions. Oh. You ask about synergy early, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because what the thing is, these four muscles acted as a synergy, yeah, co-varying among them to yeah. produce the function which was a certain activity. But this uh, this could vary all the time. So, so one of the things is that there's a lot of variable task space. So there's yeah. not one to one mapping. There's like many, many, many to one mapping. Yeah. The second thing is that, given that you have these four muscles. The geometry matters because if I change the posture a little bit, I will still be able to move the ball. But yeah. the algorithm doesn't know what the orientation of my hand is, right? Yeah. For instance. So so yeah. algorithms cannot account for like the real geometry or the 3D space in the real world. So yeah. it's losing on that as well. Yeah. And the point is, yeah, this this is completely contrary to the expectations or uh, that 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 the uh, uh, Maya control system has. And I've been arguing this for years, and now we have the data, and yeah. this sort of hits you in the face. Right. So we we are now the, we are writing this up at, yeah. as we speak, uh, coming up with um, uh, new experiments to to get a a um, a better feeling, a better idea of what are the properties of this covariation, because that if for to me is yeah. a, a fundamental in in motor control. Right. Because the uh, covariation gives you access, you know, the covariation makes you an adaptive system. Right. If you don't have that, then you're not adaptive, at oh, least yeah. on a slow, very slower time scale. Right. Uh, so this um, is a very important uh, part. And we are now uh, uh, writing it. Yeah, sorry. Especially at slower time scales. I mean, a lot of my current work and published work is showing that more and more task constraints or more and more adaptive requirements increases activity and coordination more and more at the shorter time scales than longer time scales. Sorry, can you repeat that? The more adaptive requirements of the task uh, we introduce in our experimental paradigms, and we see a lot more coordination and a lot more interactions happening at shorter time scales compared to larger time scales. We okay. consistently yeah. are observing this in our in our data. Yes. Um... Oh, let me go a bit uh, like this to through the topics. But this is um, th that's a very interesting uh, yeah. uh, point that you mentioned, uh, in particular because um, um, if you think about learning, yeah. <clears throat> if you think about learning, then uh, uh, in particular from what you call a representationalist uh, approach. Uh, learning is sort of an enrichment uh, theory because you have to build more and more rep representations to recognize uh, the different yeah. situations. Right. Um, I, 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 I think Eleanor Gibson and 
has explained this very nicely in her developmental work that it actually works completely the opposite uh, way. Um, and I really like the description of this work uh, by uh, uh, David Jacobs and Claire Michaels in their direct learning uh, paper in yeah, Ecological yeah. Psychology in 2007, because there they pit those two approaches. Um, but this has not uh, landed very well in, in motor development. Uh, because the idea there is, and I, it, it, and I explain this to my students as if you think about learning to play tennis. So you stand on the court. The first thing that you do is, and this is actually the first constraint, you know, need to learn to make the swing. Just keep the, rac the racket up and, and you make this kind of swing. Now you have practiced this a few times and then they start to throw a, ba a ball at you which adds a constraint because this means that at a certain moment in time, the the racket has to be at a certain location. Yeah. So we have the swing constraint yes. and we have that constraint. Then they say, okay, now you hit the ball all the, but now you have, have to hit the ball at the other side of the court, um, which is the third constraint. So uh, over learning, then you have to uh, learn to uh, have a back slice or a top spin. So all these things are more constraints. So the thing is, the synergy that you build to uh, control uh, the swing movement over time uh, incorporates more and more constraints. Yeah, it becomes and narrow is, in the space. Yeah, exactly. The space yeah. becomes more multidimensional. Yeah. Because first you have a simple, uh, only a few constraints. You make yeah. it more uh, multidimensional, uh, more complex, and and you narrow that in that. Uh, and That's I good. think that is uh, exactly what you uh, described uh, about your about your research. Yeah. And to me, that is a, 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 a fruitful way of thinking about uh, learning and motor learning uh, in particular. Uh, but. Um, we have not found the proper way to to um, to do uh, experiments uh, in that yeah. in that because you have to come up with a new task. Yeah. And how do you so, see the incorporation of more constraints? So um, you you know you this when you talk about learning, the dominant learning frameworks talk about, for instance, declarative learning versus you know implicit learning, implicit versus explicit learning. Uh, then, you know, uh, sensory motor versus non-sensory motor learning or reward versus punishment learning. And it has gone, the representation has gone that far to an extent that even like we talk about reward for, an, for a saccade now, right? Uh, which kind of is a little weird to think of in a in an ecological standpoint that even saccades are kind of maintained or you learn about, you know, saccadic behavior based on rewards or punishments. Yeah. So there has to be some mechanism to interpret that reward, to measure that reward, to yeah. weigh it against the expectation, you know. So it brings in all kinds of baggage of intelligence compared to what we have, you know, when we talk in terms of processes and interactions. But I agree with you that we have not been able to define properly the paradigms as well as create a terminology to think because, because thinking through things also need a terminology, right? And I don't think we yet have a satisfactory terminology from the ecological standpoint to be able to dig much deeper about learning. Um, well, uh, partly we have, but we run into problems. We run into problems. Uh, problems we run into. Uh, let's, let's first, yeah. So the, the way I. I distinguish a bit in my research programs two levels because I, I try to work what I call a systems perspective. So we have the level of the information movement coupling. Um, there you can develop new parts of the movement, new synergies, and you can uh, think of um, uh, picking up new information. Now, I think the direct learning approach is a, a very interesting approach to explain learning in terms of finding new uh, informational uh, variables. 
Yep. Um, what we try to do, we study currently a um, a uh, the building of of the learning of a new synergy of a new coordinative pattern. But actually, I think what we show because we do some UCM, UCM analysis there too. I think what you show that over learning a new coordination task, we find that a new synergy uh, emerges. And we study uh, how, um, how uh, uh, people vary and explore the uh, degrees of freedom space to end up in, uh, to, to end up on that, uh, on that uh, uh, synergy. Um, the, point is if you want to go to combine that with um, uh, perceptual learning you can think of because you have to always appreciate the perceptual part and the action part yeah so the sort of simple way of looking at it would be that you have information um, and that uh, you use at a certain moment, you use a certain information that can uh, guide that synergy because that's a control law that you have. Then for whatever learning principle or learning idea, you improve that synergy. You incorporate more constraints in that synergy. Yeah. At that moment, it might be that that information is not the proper information anymore, not the most optimal information anymore. So you need to sw switch to new information. And then there's a, a, a new space. A, yeah, and you have there's room for the uh, motor part again. So you have a cascade of of developments. I see. So so you're saying that you kind of like intermittency between perceptual uh, control versus uh, you know kind of motor control. The kind of interspersed yes. between uh, yeah. as you learn things. Yeah. Yeah, uh, but the point is that is a kind of a simplified version because most likely what happens. Yeah is that there is some kind of perceptual motor space. Right, right. But I don't have access. I don't know how to get access to that. Yeah. I mean, even the, only... the perceptual space is a little tricky to, 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 to talk about, right? Movements we can measure. So we are always talking about in the action space. Yeah, that's, that's, space. that's, yeah. that's the one of the things we, we, we try to do this with an with a, with a, a interceptive task, but actually... Yeah. What is perceived, you measure that through the action that is performed. Yeah, that's um, so that's so so there is sort of at this moment uh, conceptually we uh, we uh, get uh, get stuck. Uh, we see some uh, some uh, some hard challenges. Yeah, but for me then the only solution is to start to get to start start to measure. So we have now a setup where we can uh, manipulate the motor part and we are building a, a virtual, re virtual reality environment so that we can also start to manipulate the perceptual uh, variables right. so that we can start to tease uh, those things apart. That's not something that is done uh, soon or fast. It will last uh, a some years, but we will, we will get there. And that, I mean, data, data can only tell you uh, how to solve, uh, uh, how to get, uh, to get, get through. Um, um, so that's um, that's one thing. The other thing with learning, the way we try to think about this, um, is um, is exploration. So that's what we're interested in. Um, how can we uh, examine exploration? So in a lot of uh, what you talk about, uh, reward-based reward uh, learning and, and, and et cetera, uh, exploration is often uh, uh, some kind of trial and error uh, process. The and the, the, there is this point of principles uh, again um, uh, from an ecological perspective and in the direct learning uh, approach. There, the idea is that you set up a space, an information space, and that space guides you through. Uh, the information that is uh, that uh, you can use for that uh, for that movement. One of the issues is that in that in that in that approach, there is no room for uh, for variability. And there's room right. for change of the variable, but there is the kind of um, um, 
uh, yeah. David uh, David Jacob calls this the vector field, and that that vector field forces you to uh, the uh, to the information of variable that you should use. So there's this this um, this. Well, I'm not sure how to call this, but there is this kind of let's call this interesting thing that in ecological psychology we 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 try to build and for good reasons yeah. we try to build a theory of specificity and at least or perceptually. But the point is then you remove all variability, while variability and covariation yeah. is utmost important. Uh, as a biological system for our evolution survival. Right. Um, and that is a kind of a tension. So in the program of ecological psychology, you have this um, link to dynamical systems where variability is sort of the basic thing. Yeah. And you have the specificity part in ecological psychology that is a uh, that, that sort of tries to get rid of all this variability because you have this one invariant that you should use for that task. And that is a bit um, uh, that is uh, quite a challenge uh, how to how to think. Uh, how to think about... both. Yeah. The, yes. And, Especially and, from measurements. Uh, yes. Yeah. But also conceptually. Right. So if 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 there is um, no uh, room for uh, variability, then. Um, One would like to think of as information for learning as a kind of an attractor where you go to. But if there is no room for variability, then there. What is the what, what yeah? Is so the attractor so, property. Uh, then? So you are stuck in that attractor space, you know, like where like yeah. how do you move to that like, like how do you move and when do you move and why do you move, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I mean, to be to be honest, I am not a, a big endorser of. Uh, I don't endorse very heavily this uh, the idea of like low dimensional spaces. I personally feel that low dimensional spaces are more like and and my collaborators and some of my collaborators also think the same that low dimensional chaos generally is like a toy explanation for things rather than uh, being being the actual explanations or being being able to capture the actual complexity uh, because because ultimately and they're also very prone to predation by the representational approach because then one can argue that this attractive space is actually a representation. You have like five or six different attractive spaces. They're all represented differently, right? So they kind of make you vulnerable to fall in the same uh, trap of, of categories uh, which you began, which you adapted the, to just to get rid of. So, so I think, so, so that's the reason, you know, I, for instance, go for more complex and more numerical methods like cascades where uh, I can stay away from attractors, but still able to explain things based on non-linear and 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 variability ideas. Oh, I I don't think these are. Um... I'm not. I'm not sure if I think that they necessarily need to be low-dimensional uh, spaces. Although from a control perspective, that's uh, that's uh, often uh, right. quite uh, quite. Uh, quite handy um but I, I i i think i like to think about this in terms of your uh high dimensional space where uh depending on the constraints that act at a certain moment only a limited set of attractors uh, can be stable so and but as a function of the constraints these attractors change so that makes that you um, um, uh, have high dimensional space which temporary temporarily uh, behaves as a low dimensional space but the properties of that space depend on your uh, task uh, constraints at, that act at that moment i'm so, not sure i don't so, i don't know if yeah. this makes sense no, so no, no, this makes sense, and it is it is a fluid explanation. So does it mean that we will never be able to understand the state of the system? All we can understand is how the system moves over time. 
Uh, yes, because the state of the system essentially is for the system not that interesting. Because, well, this, yeah. uh, the, these potential states could change uh, if the circumstances uh, change. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, I mean, uh, you no, know, you're right, and I'm I'm with you. I'm just trying to think from like a from the developer of a prosthesis, for instance, right? So for yeah. a, for for an engineer to devise a prosthesis, they they are looking for something more tangible, right? Something more stable, more specific, yeah. less variable, right? Yes, I am. Um, I will tell you in a few years. I hope. <laughs> yeah. yeah. As we 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 uh, will uh, next week we will submit a grant where we collect where we actually insert these ideas where we work yeah. with uh, machine learning people, and actually one of the idea is uh, can you um, uh, change the machine learning mechanisms um, to uh, um, incorporate some of these properties of the biological system of, of and, and and can you set constraints within in, within, within machine, machine learning? learning that that sort of fulfill this so that the, that that this notion of co-variation yeah. that they can exploit uh, that I I have no idea how we're going to do that but that's that's one of the things that we are uh, uh, at least um, I see that one of as one of my bigger challenges because that brings my interest in terms of motor control because this is hardcore motor control essentially and yeah. uh, tying it directly to a very applied uh, applied right. uh, topic yeah. that's very that's very interesting however it talks to the same problem you mentioned before where you had an idea and they said like you know why don't you execute it first before asking for the money so i, <laughs> I hope they don't they don't they don't come back saying that, that. That's, that's i really a, wish you all the best for this we have we have because we have some basic data now that we show yeah. the phenomena yeah then yeah. we um um uh can uh, can he, yeah and and just to briefly get back at this point of variability in ecological psychology and then um the, the way I tend to think about this is uh and this is very speculative but if you have your uh, control or your information movement coupling then we have a quite a solid uh, theory, well, theory at least a method, an, an uncontrolled manifold idea, where you have different ways of uh, performing the same uh, movement. Um, in ecological psychology, I think we have everything there, but it has not been worked out. But if you have a certain informational variable, then you have um, uh, a perceptual system that can pick up that informational variable through uh, different uh, mechanisms. Yeah. So, for instance, in this uh, flyball catching, our traditional example, you uh, there, you uh, are guided by uh, uh, optical acceleration. You can perceive acceleration by um, fixing your head in the in uh, fixing your eyes in your head and use your vestibular system to track the ball. You can have the balls uh, move over the retina to detect. Uh, no, but you can. Uh, so there are different perceptual mechanisms that yeah. can pick up this right. one. Uh, so if you then have this model, you have information and movement. But below there, you have mechanisms right. that allow for variability. And basically, this perceptual system is um, is basically a synergy. Because it performs this function, is picking up that information through the means that are available at that moment in time. Yeah, that that makes sense. I mean, we can stand by closing our eyes. In fact, you know, people who are blind, they can do almost everything. You know, yeah, uh, just by you know haptic sense or vestibular sense. People who cannot yeah. hear also, they can you know catch a lot of things. Uh, and people who have all the senses can do so as well with almost similar kind of fidelity. Yeah. So it has to be it has to be like that, right? Yeah, yeah, but the the notion of perceptual system is is, is very uh, strong. Yes, but it has not been studied that much in uh, ecological psychology. Yeah. I would say that brings back to Gibson. You know, the idea of uh, senses considered perceptual systems is actually yeah. pretty profound. If you yeah, let me start pondering over that. Yeah, 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 yeah. So I think uh, our work on uh, what I hope to do uh, is. Uh, um, 
once we have a better grasp on this idea of synergy, which I studied till still uh, from the first uh, moments that I started in this field. Yeah. Uh, I, at one point in time, I hope to uh, to uh, in integrate that these ideas into the perceptual uh, system. So, so Albert, the challenge there is that you have people studying synergy from. I mean, synergy is also one of those words which has been used to describe almost everything and anything. Yeah. So now you have uh, researchers who use synergies to talk more about, for instance, neural constraints or or neural coupling or co-variation of muscles. And then you have folks who have been using synergy to describe of more things moving together in a very uh, context dependent manner. So something which is structurally grounded and something which is functionally grounded, for instance. Yeah. Do we yeah. need, so how do we kind of navigate that distinction in the functional structure space or we do not need to, we can just consider synergies as something encompassing both and move with it? Um, I, I, I think, um that um, uh, in broad strokes, I agree with your analysis of the literature. I have the muscle synergy approach where they say, okay, you activate uh, uh, spinal cords, uh, yeah. intermotor neurons, uh, interneurons in the spinal cord that activate particular uh, proportions uh, of muscles. Yeah. The funny thing is you look at all these um, uh, papers, is that they usually quite easily accept that the synergy changes over different conditions. Yes. Which, yeah. from a functional perspective, is okay. Yeah. But from a structural perspective, this means that you then sort of started to activate different synergies, or that's a step that is very easily made uh, in the literature. Yeah. While conceptually, if you thought about the structural approaches, the structural activation, then um, it wouldn't make sense to have uh, uh, thousands of these synergies laying around that you then sort of uh, activate particular for this task, right? That so there is so so there's there's a kind of an, an interesting uh, thing in that field, right? Uh, and they they also quantify synergies like five synergies, six synergies, or like yes, this, yeah, right. But yeah. we, we, the Tim Vaughan part of my PhD students has, has one or two papers out that we actually show. And uh, actually, at the moment you start to investigate the learning of synergies, you sort of uh, remove yourself from the point that they are structurally embedded. Right. And they are flexible. How, how else otherwise you can explain learning based on synergies? There's no way. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, but uh, of course they have the cortical input and that sort of would explain part of the variability. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think the notion of synergies is, is it, as a time of, as a, some kind of coordinative pattern is very helpful in that part of the literature. And I'm, I'm not against uh, that. Yeah. However, I think the challenge lies, there are actually two mechanisms at work if you think about motor control. One is the mechanism of co-variation and that's what, what, what uh, Gregor has developed the control manifold. Uh, but the other part, the, the other part is that you, so the, the co-variation makes that your end effector is stable and yes. you can move you can move all your uh you can use all kinds of collections of elemental variables that that stabilize this uh, position yeah however if you perform a movement then you have to go away from that position right the challenge is to come up with an approach where you explain in the same vein that you can um, have co-activation that changes the end effector yeah. and co-activation to compensate for perturbations uh, or, or, or being adaptive. And, and because in terms of control, these sort of are orthogonal to each other. Yes, yes. And if you have the famous picture of Mark, which I think he showed it also with the, the, the two forces uh, and they have the, the uncontrolled manifold uh, line yeah. in here, 
then the um the the moving is the orthogonal line yeah in that plot and you have the co-variation so yeah. if once you if you have a simple task and that's uh, I don't think it's it's necessarily simple, but uh, experimental simple of the uh, of the uh, finger force uh, pressing that Mark uh, does a lot. Yeah. Um, but explaining what happens uh, in a uh, moving arm, then these two these two ideas need to sort of work together. Yes, and so far they do not. Um, they are well. I, I I think the model of Gregor Schoener can do it. Okay, but um, it's not accessible yet. How? <laughs> yeah, I think too too few people understand how it's really going. Uh, it, from the idea of synergies, uh, of yeah. course, and yeah. um, um, because you have mechanisms like. Uh, uh, like the equilibrium point, you have the stabilizing factors of the equilibrium point, where you can shift the equilibrium point. Um, and in there, I, I mean, that's a bit Mark's, uh, Mark's story, of course. In there, the artist is the synergy uh, notion, where you see deviation of the equilibrium point that 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 uh, accounts for the the um, uh, the yeah. co-variation around. Uh, uh, so. But in terms of control, I, I, I'm not sure if these the, the idea are, ideas are sort of living in two different worlds. Because one right. world focuses right. on the co-variation, the other world focuses on the co-activation too. And, but I think to understand what's go, how the system works, you need to merge uh, those uh, uh, in some way or the other. Right. Yeah. No, I, I, I'm completely with you on this. I mean, I, I mean, this is what we discussed with Mark, right? I mean, you would have noticed in that podcast where like Mark was very open to, you know, acknowledge that, you know, once you define a boundary or like a region uh, uh, and identify a variable, that's when you can apply the ideas of like you see him. Yeah. And that kind of keeps it a little challenging because when you are talking about like movements in general, where we are changing from one task to the other, you know, on an everyday basis, uh, we kind of not just move within the room, we kind of keep moving Keep expanding or you know shrinking that room as well as moving to other of those you know uh, task parameters. So yeah, how to account for that that interpretation? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. But I mean, um, Gregor came up with the idea in ninety five and ninety nine. They had uh, their first experimental paper. We are now twenty five years uh, later. There are different groups and they are uncontrolled manifold. Uh, I think. 10, 15 years ago, you had to explain the basics uh, uh, everywhere. I know sort of most people uh, in the yeah, field no. uh, know what, at least have some gist uh, of the idea. Yeah. Um, so now it's time to move on uh, and to 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 see, okay, uh, how, how to further the developments. And uh, that's that is certainly on my list of, of, of things to do in the coming uh, in the coming uh, years. Yeah. Right. So uh, this was an interesting conversation. I mean, coming back now to like more sociological aspects of science. So these are like big ideas and, you know, we really want to move things, you know, prostheses and things like that. But at the same time, and and you acknowledge that, you know, the, the you couldn't move things as much as you wanted to, right? Uh, uh, you know, yeah. the shift has not been uh, gigantous. So uh, like what kind of sociological constraints have you faced? Like, for instance, like, do you think that the idea that we have to, we kind of chase a lot of deadlines as scientists, right? Like for instance, abstract submissions, you know, these conferences, uh, you know, grand deadlines, the, the paper revisions, the idea that you have to, you know, reformat the papers for multiple submissions. I mean, a lot of things which do not contribute directly to science, but you yeah. have to navigate them just to be able to do science. Yeah. So do you think some of those things actually are orthogonal to our uh, to our ability to think more deeply and think more, expensively in a, in a lot of these things yes <laughs> uh, i i i um in particular and and this is true for all of us uh, we work in a medical environment which means that um also for our very fundamental work we have to fulfill a lot of uh, administrative uh yeah and compliance yeah 
Yeah, exactly. Uh, before we can do what we want to do. Well, yeah. there is no actually no real need to do that, but that's just a system we uh, yeah. have to work into. Um, and that is, um, I, I really think that that is a a, a real issue uh, for all for our, in particular for the young people. Yeah. Um, because if you and then. So you can do it, but then you need a really good system and a really sort of big lab where people where you can hire people for longer time that that can take over these jobs, uh, part of these jobs uh, for you, because um, at this moment I think for for uh, at least for me, but also a lot of my colleagues, I think that the administrative tasks are just uh, too high. Yeah, and uh, it depends a bit on. Uh, I'm, depends a bit on how you but well i'm not smart enough to do within the work time do an interesting science and do all the administrative tasks that's yeah. i'm i'm not uh, so i have to sort of work extra to 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 make up uh, for yeah that. i am in the happy situation that i sort of yeah i can allocate time of my for myself to think but i i feel that's not enough Right. I feel that we right. we should have more time to write a position paper or just an experimental paper. I I think I do too much uh, via student via student work, um. And the the problem with the grants is if you you have to always overreach, yeah. And sometimes you have bad luck because then you get all the grants, and sometimes yeah. you have bad luck you get no grants. But if you get them all, then it's too busy in the lab. And when you get no, then it's not busy enough. So, it's, and it is a permanent, there's, it's difficult to get a kind of a consistency uh, in that. Right. And you have to adjust to the, the topics of the grant uh, a bit. So it's not that you can define, at least we don't have, we have some personal, um, personal uh, fundings here that, um, uh, but they are very, very difficult to get. Yeah. Uh, so um, we have now a a a, a, a big uh, we have repairs which uh, which is uh, a collaboration of different um, a, ecological psychologies in Europe yeah. together with companies and and clinical partners where we use uh, we will study uh, uh, perception action learning right and try to come up with ideas to translate that to uh, to uh, to clinical. Uh, uh, situations. Um, I have to admit that we, the part of the translation is still uh, is still under development, and I'm not sure how far we will get there. But at least we have some intention yeah. of, of doing that. Um, but there, you also see that we needed to spend a lot of time to build some uh, basics in, in fundamental science before we could before we can make the step. Right. Um, yeah. So, so to to come back, I think the um, it, it's really a challenge uh, at the moment, yeah. and the, for me, the only way is to to organize the lab in a way that uh, that people can take over some of these uh, sort of uh, yeah. jobs. Um, but it's very difficult. To, at least I find it very difficult to organize. Yeah. It's also in our field. In particular, have not that much um, money for postdocs. There don't exist that many grants, particularly for postdocs. So we um, have to. Um, uh, while you need some postdocs to build a kind of a hierarchical structure in your lab, yeah, that is uh, that uh, that makes it uh, makes it difficult. Yeah, right. So we don't a... have. Uh, it's a, we don't. I think in the US you have these kind of. Um, uh, the five-year lab grant, so to say. Yeah, other ones, yeah. Yeah, that, that we don't have that. Right. Those are very difficult to get, by the way. So, I mean, especially for younger, you know, people. Yeah. So, uh, but yeah, but, but there are, uh, theoretically, there are mechanisms and that have helped establish a lot of good research programs. Yeah, That's yeah, true. yeah, yeah. Right. On the other hand, we... we we have a lot of we don't we have uh, we don't have uh, individual equipment 
So we, yeah. we everything is from the department. Yeah. So there's also tech support from the department. So that that relieves also part of that. Yeah, so that's the same here. Yeah. In in all this in all the systems you have. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, good things and bad things. Bad things. So that uh, in the end you just have to look at your system and see how can you thrive right. in that system. Yeah. So so where I am right now, I mean, one of the I'm kind of fortunate to be, you know, at uh, Nebraska Omaha. So we have central facilities. And I don't need to manage the technical aspects of things myself. We have a code mm -hmm. to manage that. And I just yeah. wonder, you know, if I have to manage along with the research and grant, you know, also the lab space, yeah. it will be like, uh, it will def drastically slow down, you know, my productivity and ability to think. So, so that's very true. It, I can imagine that. On yeah. the other hand, um, um, because we have the same thing here, yeah. But this means that everything which is what is designed is designed for multiple purposes. Yes. Well, uh, customization have, is difficult. Yeah. yeah. Well, you have your lab, you just build it quick and dirty that it works for you. Yeah. Uh, so now I balance it's, it's a kind of balance. You have just right. have to work with the system that you have and, right, and right. optimize uh right. optimize that. Yeah. No, i I'm just trying to reduce my administrative load. I mean, it's not from the department per se. But the whole, the way the science works is, right, for instance, when you submit the journals now, articles like this, so many times it just comes back, like, why can't you shift this line from here to there? So it's like additional step, you know? So a lot yeah. of those things just keep coming in your face and you're trying to navigate, like, give me the space I want to do real work, you know? <laughs> so. Uh, yes. Yeah. Uh, that You get also smarter at that over time. You do, you do get smarter. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, and and uh, chat GTP, uh, I don't know how much you use, but for instance, for a lot of like junk work, for instance, like some, you know, blur putting here or there, right? Now chat GTP helps, you know, if you have written the paper and you have the abstract, you can produce blurbs for like n number of, you know, uh, submissions. Okay. Uh, right. Yeah, so I... that makes it very easy. And those are useless I... blurbs. Like people just want it here and there, you know, for submissions, they will never be published. But you have to write it, you know. For instance, frontiers while submitting. Yeah, yeah. I've and never that, used a Chat uh, GPT. Uh, yeah. Yet. So, so well, and I wonder, like, if something Chat GTP can do, then why do we even are required to do it? You know, like, just get rid of that because Chat GTP can do it. So you don't need me to do it. You know, as a researcher. Uh, yes. Yeah, but of course it's your paper, so they want some authority to have looked at it. Uh, exactly. <laughs> That's true. But but things are becoming easier, and we have more and more. Kind of support, you know, once you are, once you can find out and you have the ability to find, we can make yeah. things easy regardless. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, when I think, you know, when I get like sometimes too frustrated about things, then I think of like 30 years back when people had to go to the library to, to read abstracts. But now I can search on Google Scholar, you know, and, and read like 100 articles in a day. So a lot of things actually have reduced over time as well while administrative load has increased. Uh, yes, but the number of papers that come out now are so so tremendously high compared oh, yes. to. Uh, I remember when I was a PhD, I did one afternoon a month, uh, usually on a Friday afternoon. I went to the library, go through all the new uh, volumes, and you picked out, you copied, and you read, and you. Um, I re really enjoyed that uh, time, yeah. but now you get all these e talks, but there are so many that you sort of. Uh, we are drowning. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh, as we discussed, we are drowning in 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 data, not as much as in ideas, but we are definitely drowning in data. Yeah, and the, the challenge is how to how to 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 yeah yeah to, to keep to the good uh, to the good ideas and to translate uh, those into good ideas. Yeah, yeah, and 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 keep contributing uh, to them. Um, I don't know if I have a particular uh, strategy uh, to that, but. Um, but I but I do know that sometimes I just um, don't. I mean, the world can explode, sort of, uh, or my email box can explode. But then I just want to read that paper, and then yeah. you know, and, um, yes, that is sometimes difficult. But that uh, I really um, um, really force myself to do that. The only thing um, what I notice is that. You have to do that on a regular basis because your mind your mind needs to wander to get good ideas. Yes. And if you have very occasionally this one day sort of empty in your schedule, then that day 
your brain says, well, we're not going to read today because I need to wander today. Right. And then it becomes very frustrating. So you need to acknowledge, you need to really feel when you need to let your brain wander. And you can do that preferably in meetings or something like that. Or uh, <laughs> because because that your brain needs that to be focused at some points. Because yeah. you cannot be focused 24 hours a day for seven of days. Of course not. Week. No. So and that and they're finding that balance, and that is what 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 age uh, sometimes gives you that you sort of get a better feel of when to peak and when not and also yeah. i had to learn this really accept that at some point when my schedule was free and yeah. i wanted to do really interesting stuff then nothing happened uh, that day and that could really frustrate me yeah. but now i actually know if a free day is coming up then i sort of build in wonder time beforehand so yeah. that i know that i don't need it that much at that day right right and the idea is to not push push yourself for you know for those times uh but you know like just stay calm and you know hover around things and yeah and that's that's actually very true like some of the best ideas come by i'm waiting for the bus or like i'm in the yeah i'm taking a shower and you know some 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 place where you just don't expect yeah and, exactly and, and yeah. In some of the some of the papers i've written from the ideas you know uh from those spaces that, that's very true and the more you pack up your, your calendar the more packed it is, the more you end up doing, but the less ideas and the less conceptually uh, yeah. you kind of grow. Well, and, and, and good lab meetings help in that. Yeah, Definitely. lab meetings definitely help. A uh, good good group where you have yes. some input and then yeah. you, the ideas start to flow and then uh, people... Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Definitely. So, yeah. Raul, uh, 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 before I you know end today's conversation, uh, one last question to you is like, you know, given that a lot of your work has been focused now on the space of cross thesis and development from basic perspective, uh, for somebody starting, you know, to, to work in cross thesis, what are the some of the big questions that they should focus on uh, and what should be the approach? Uh, I know you have covered quite a bit, but uh, in short, as a take-home um, message. I think from the level of procedures that I look at it, yeah. Because um, uh, several more clinical oriented people will will uh, say uh, what what the patient um, um, says, um, but I think um, approach the problem from a fundamental uh, perspective. It might be internal models. It might be optimal control. It might be ecological psychology, which I personally prefer, but take your sort of thinking, uh, your, your, your framework, conceptual framework. And then the two main problems is how to get um, uh, feedback or per perception in there. And the other is uh, improving the actual control and make um, improve on the uh, intent detection. Because you, 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 prestigious does what you sort of, what your intention is. Yeah. But um, because of the co-variation, there's this big problem in, uh, in uh, what the intent actually was, because the intent is underspecified in terms of, because you have the co-variation. So, yeah. and that, that, these are, are the big, big, uh, big problems there. Okay. Yeah. And they kind of bridge the, the, the psychology of, or, you know, the softer side with the with the neuroscientific side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 No, but the, basically, that's the, the the link between uh, uh, the synergies and uh, the perceptual systems. I uh, can do that because the perceptual systems would be my entry in the brain. But right. if I had to do that, that right. would be along perceptual systems. I like that. It's a it's a it can be a nice title of a of a review article as well. Perceptual system as entry to the brain. Really yeah. nice. I, 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 the special issue on uh, on um, yes on on brain. Uh, I think uh, the notion of perceptual systems was was missing too much. Let's put it like that. Right, right. I, I completely yeah. agree with you. Yeah. So th thanks all for a very insightful conversation, uh, and for the viewers uh, who want to think about prosthesis, Raul is the place to go. Uh, uh, coming up with some really fascinating studies. Uh, I have been following it for a decade now. Uh, and I'll put a link uh, or links to several of his 
uh, published work in the description of this art of this uh, podcast. Thanks, uh, Raul, and uh, have a great day ahead. Thank you for inviting me, and thank you for the great uh, conversation. I really yeah. enjoyed it. Thanks a lot. Same. Bye. Okay. Cheers. Cheers.